In this segment, we're going to take the ideas that we introduced about model theoretic semantics and make them more concrete, tie them to constituency parsing, and see how to actually operationalize this stuff. So we're going to take our example of Lady Gaga Sings as our running example here. And we're going to be operating in a framework called Montague semantics due to Richard Montague, where we view this sentence as expressing something about the world which is either true or false. And again, we have this notion of a world which looks like this. This is a database that uh, contains entities and values of these predicates on them and things like that. So for example, uh, we have Lady Gaga and Eminem here, and we have the predicate sings, which for both of them is set to true. Uh, and so the statement Lady Gaga sings is true. And so when we think about its denotation, which again is the result of evaluating it against this database, uh, the, we, we, can, you know, we can make this concrete. So one additional element that we're going to introduce here is that we have to be also concrete about the entities we're talking about. So Lady Gaga up above in the sentence, that's just a string, right? That's not like a pointer into the database. And so you have this entity resolution problem that you need to uh, solve as well, where the denotation of Lady Gaga, we're going to represent as E470 here. Um, and this is like an ID that you should think of as a pointer into this database. Uh, and in this case, the denotation of that string is just this entity pointer. And then we can talk about the denotation of uh, an expression like sings of E470. And this is true because E470 has the sings predicate set to true in this, in this table up above. And so we're going to have to think about how to map, you know, again, in order to make this process concrete, we're going to have to think about how to go from this statement, Lady Gaga sings, to this formal representation, sings of E470. And while this looks fairly straightforward, we still, like, this is still a conversion that has to happen, and there are cases that can make it tricky. So starting from this parse tree, what we're going to see is that we're going to be able to leverage the lambda calculus ideas that we introduced before to build up this uh, representation of meaning for this sentence in a compositional way. And here's what that means. So our first step is to take this sings predicate and ground it. So we have to take it and interpret it with respect to our world. And in this case, again, we have just the string sings, and we have to map that to this column in the, uh, in the database, which is labeled as sings. But um, in, you know, in general, these things wouldn't necessarily be exactly identical. And so what we do is we convert uh, this sings verb here into a lambda calculus expression uh, where we have a lambda that takes one argument y, which is the entity, and returns a logical form sings of y. So this is a function of one argument. And notice that we haven't referenced E470 or Lady Gaga anywhere. So uh, we're going to associate that lambda calculus expression with this verb phrase as well. And it turns out that the entity that, that fills in here is going to come from the noun phrase. And so uh, we have this entity resolution step, as we discussed. And so we need to attach, uh, or we need to resolve Lady Gaga here to be E470. And then what we can do is an instance of what we call function application. So we could take this lambda calculus expression and apply it to E470 and basically ram these two things together. And what happens is sings, lambda y sings of y is a function of one argument. Uh, that argument is the y here, uh, which we plug in E470. And so it returns this expression sings of E470. And so notice, again, we're not trying to say that this sentence, right now we're just parsing the sentence to this formal representation sings of E470. Um, we're not actually evaluating that yet. We're just saying that's what this sentence means. And then separately, we have to take that and look at our database and say, OK, given this particular database, is this true? Or are we in some like alternate reality where Lady Gaga is not a singer? So the nice thing is that as, you know, as much as I said that syntactic parsing didn't necessarily capture all the notions of semantics that we want, 
Syntactic parsing is going to be a useful bridge to allow us to build these kinds of representations. And so um, there's definitely some friction here, and we're not going to get into the full range of issues, but we're going to kind of illustrate how the ideas from syntactic parsing can inform how we build these representations. So here's a slightly more complicated example, Lady Gaga sings and dances. And so the new piece here is that uh, in order to form the representation of this VP here over sings and dances, we have to combine these two individual predicates, sings and dances. And so what actually happens here is a sort of higher order function application, right? Where uh, to ram these things together with and, we have some function that takes two functions, the lambda y sings and the lambda y dances, and combines them and basically unifies their arguments into a single lambda y sings of y dances of y. Um, and then this second function application step is as before, uh, where we just plug in E470 for both things. So there, what this shows is that there are some general rules that we can use here. It's not all just like specific mappings of verbs to predicates. Um, for example, we have this uh, constituency rule, VP goes to VP, CC, VP. Basically, we're coordinating two verb phrases. And in orange here, we see this lambda calculus representation of what's going on there. We're taking uh, lambda y a of y, lambda y b of y, and ramming those together. All right, and then again, uh, similar to what we saw on the previous slide, when we form a sentence out of a noun phrase and a verb phrase, the verb phrase is going to be some function, the noun phrase is going to be uh, an entity, and what we're doing is we're applying that function to that entity here. Okay, so the, you know, we can, we can generalize this to more complex predicates as well. So, for example, here we have born. And this is more complicated than sings because it's what we call a two-place predicate. So there's two arguments here. There is a date argument and also an entity argument. And so born at the bottom of the tree here is going to be a lambda calculus representation that's actually kind of two nested lambdas. Lambda x, lambda y, born y, comma x. And the order here is, is specific. So what we do first is we, uh, well, we, we have to ground out March 28, 1986, which again, that's a string. And so we need to convert that into our formal representation that whatever we're using for dates. And then when we go up the tree, we do function application and we do that first with the date. So the first thing that's going to get filled is this X slot. So born is not like some symmetric operation, right? There's a person born at a time. And so the first argument it expects is the date. And that follows the idea from syntax here that the verb combines with its object before it combines with its subject. So following that idea, we need these lambdas to be in this particular order. So we first kind of unpack the outer lambda and return this inner expression, lambda y, born of y, with now 328.1986 as the argument. Uh, and then we're going to combine that with Lady Gaga, and we're going to get our final expression here now with both arguments populated. So, in, so to handle basically these more complex expressions, we need uh, we, we need these kind of nested lambda calculus expressions. But this nicely shows the power of this framework to let us build up these compositional representations of meaning. All right. And so one question we might bring up is, okay, we kind of punted on what's going on here with was, right? So do we need some sort of way of indicating that this happened in the past? And this is where uh, these, this sort of nice story about semantic representations and lambda calculus and such breaks down a little bit, um, because there's a lot of tricky things. Like, let's say you have the statement, Lady Gaga sang well yesterday. Well, okay, no, now we're no longer just saying she's a singer, but there was this like particular event, and at that event, she sang well. So, you know, one way to do this is to wrap all that up inside the predicate, where there's now a time and a manner associated with it. Um, you can also have the so-called Neo-Davidsonian view of semantics, where uh, you're saying there exists an event E. This E was a singing event. Someone was singing, and 
the, the agent of this, the person doing the singing was E470, and the manner of the singing was well, and etc. And the problem is like, how do we actually evaluate this with respect to a world? It's like, well, we need a database of like any time someone ever sung, right? And so if you say things like, I like to sing in the shower, well, now we can't, you know, uh, we can't say anything about the truth of that statement because we don't have a database that says, you know, that you were, that you sing in the shower and that you like that and, and stuff like that. So, you know, as much as these representations are useful, they kind of break down when talking about events like this. All right, so we also talked about this quantification ambiguity, and so this is another, another big uh, challenge, and it's actually one that we haven't really addressed so far. So synt syntactically, both of these uh, expressions, the kind of one person friends with everyone and everyone has a different friend, these actually have the same syntactic parse. So we're gonna need something else to deal with the fact that there's a semantic ambiguity here that's not in the syntax. Um, again, like, you know, similar to the singing in the shower example, it's very hard to nail down indefinite things. So like, Amy ate a waffle, we say, okay, there exists a waffle and Amy ate it, right? And, you know, again, without kind of referencing some database of waffles, we can't really evaluate the truth of this. So this representation still might be useful for some other things, but we can't apply it in the, in the way that we've been building up so far. Um, and then finally, you have uh, these expressions which just really kind of stress this framework, like cats eat mice. Like, we all understand in a common sense way what this means, but what does this actually mean in terms of quantification? Do we say that like all cats eat mice like for each, for all cats, there is some mouse that that cat has eaten. Like it's actually really hard to make this kind of thing concrete. And so, you know, actually nailing everything down in terms of definite uh, sort of first order logic is pretty challenging. And so this is what led, has led people to, for tasks like textu textual entailment, not use representations like this and instead rely more on neural nets that are gonna kind of do this heavy lifting for us. Okay, so what this stuff is gonna be useful for is tasks like question answering, um, where we're gonna say that we could take a question, convert it into a sem semantic representation, and then answer it based on that representation. So syntax doesn't tell you everything about that, but it does give you the right structure. And so we're gonna set up the problem of semantic parsing, which is building up these semantic representations, and we're gonna look at these specifically for these tasks where they really make sense. Um, database querying slash question answering. And so we're gonna see how uh, a particular representation uh, called combinatory categorial grammar is going to allow us to produce these kinds of lambda calculus representations and allow us to answer simple questions that we wanna execute against a database. So that's where we're headed next and that's the end of the segment.